The amazing thing is, is that we filled about 50 pounds of papaya in there uh, this morning, shredded it up, and the colony is just absolutely thriving. So right now I want to take an aspect of, you know, I'm bombarding you with all these terminology and words, and now is the time to kind of do the workshop part. And so at any point, raise questions. Um, I'm going to do my best to see you guys and uh, be interrupted, but this is definitely not just a philosophical point anymore. This is about making you guys understand some of the dynamics of what it is that we're trying to do in order to become an insect farmer. And so this is the workshop part. And so I got to start, obviously, with the insect again. And we kind of went over to so that we can, here you go. So in a way, the black soldier fly is a beneficial insect found on every continent except Antarctica. So Hawaii is included. Unlike pest flies, the flying adult is not the main life cycle of the organism. The flying adults can't eat and only live for seven to nine days. So their purpose is just to mate and lay eggs. It's crucial that they conserve energy by hiding within the canopy of the trees and shrubs. The only time the female ever comes near waste is when she's about to lay her eggs, after which she dies shortly. The flying adults are actually very common, it's very common in the Big Island, and but they are rarely observed, and most importantly, they're not associated with the spread of disease. So, to go in depth on the life cycle, we're going to start with eggs, we're going to go to larva, we're going to go to pupa. And so, from that, let's start with the beginning phase. So, obviously a pregnant female comes in and lays eggs. So a lot of people already have asked me, well, how is it that you get this biopod started out there? And I say, well, what happens is i got to create a little bit of stink to let her know that there is something to be eaten. And she comes by and she lays these tiny little eggs. A female can lay up to a thousand eggs and typically it all happens above the waist. Okay? If you see eggs, that also means that you've got active adults mating in your surroundings. So uh, that's a really good uh, indicator because a lot of people think they don't have them and suddenly they spot eggs. Well, once you've got eggs, you're going to start getting them. Now, what's unique is that the eggs take a little bit longer to hatch. They take about 48 hours, okay? A lot of fly species, like fruit fly, house fly, it just takes a matter of hours, okay? So when you first start a colony and you're naturally seeding, guess what you're doing? You're just very, very basically putting out some waste, and then they come and the lady eggs. So for us, it's real simple. I've created the biopod, so you'll you open it up and so basically you just throw in a little bit of food waste every day and so it creates a little bit more stink makes it a little bit more attractive and the first sign that you need to know if you're successful is you'll see egg laying and where do you see egg laying you see them on the bottom of the lid and you see them all around the walls of the container inside there so that's a that's probably your first step you'll notice is that these clusters of eggs are actually quite, they're bigger than a screw, so you can observe them quite easily, just train yourself to look for that. So that's the beginning of the life cycle, is a female will come in and lay eggs, and then guess what? She dies, so she does not spread disease. How do they get in? They, they fly. No, into the plastic. Oh, what happens here is the lid is actually a venting lid, and so it does not, Normally there's a screw in this lid, but we got we got these last minute, uh, and I didn't want to open up the kits that come with it. So what happens is 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 you can this doesn't sit tightly, okay, and so it allows for air to ventilate out, and that space or that gap is enough for the female to come in and lay her eggs, and all, all she needs is a little bit of odor to tell her that this is where she needs to be. What keeps other flies from doing? Other flies do do that, and they're quicker. So when you start a colony, you will expect at first, just like any compost pile, you'll get fruit fly, house fly, and you'll sometimes get ants. But then, 
after the eggs hatch 48 hours later, and then the grubs grow to a sizable quantity, what you'll notice is they become what's called niche dominant, and they take over and they kick out the fruit fly, the house fly, the blow fly, they kick them all out, and that is their waste. And so a lot of forensic entomologists, when they have to like determine time of death and it's already a few weeks, they'll look at the development of these guys because that gives them a larger scale operation. So, and there's no other fly that's gonna kick them out, you see? So um, that's working with nature's niche dominant recycler has a lot of benefits. We've done tests with Texas A&M and they really wanted to do house fly. You know why? They understood the entire genetic code. They had all kinds of information about it. And they said, you know, if you you got to use housefly. The whole industry, all fly studies are done on housefly. Well, guess what? We had to do it indoors, close it off, and we got it so sealed up and we were using chicken manure. Well, it didn't take very long before the entire housefly colony collapsed indoors and the soldier fly took over. So why fight nature if you just work with them and the house fly is a disease vector and they're not so anyway so the next stage is after 48 hours the eggs hatch and you'll get grubs now there's seven stages in the grub cycle i'm not going to go through it but just think of it very easily from small to large okay and so what happens is is that i've seen grubs go through this stage the fastest ever about two or three weeks uh, typically, anywhere from four weeks in colder climates, they can go three months without actually going to the next stage, which is the pupa. This is, yes? What keeps them from eating each other? Um, well, I don't think they're cannibals, but they do eat other fly species. So they do do, that's how they control. They're the biggest guy in the pile, and they make sure that nobody else gets in. Even the small grubs, they won't. No, they know their own species. I mean, I know their own species too when I look at them, so. Uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am? So, they live longer the colder it is? Yes, what happens is, is um, the reproductive cycle is done by the flying adult, correct? And so the flying adult, like other flying insects, only operates parts of the year. So bees, for example, don't operate in winter time because they're trying to conserve energy. Well, this fly, because he's also conserving energy, chooses to prolong his grub phase, okay, and avoid having to pupate and reproduce in wintertime. So they're naturally adaptive, taking long, extensive vacations and eating a lot, a lot, a lot of food. And that's more to do with they know when it is that they need to reproduce. Yes, sir, in the back. Both. Uh, w for example, one of the reasons it's very difficult to get them to mate indoors is because you don't have those uh, pho photoic cycles. Um, but um, temperature also is a big indicator. So what we've done is we've been able to get them to mate in wintertime in a greenhouse. So obviously the light schedule has changed in wintertime, but because the temperature is at 75, they're fine. So. I hope that answers the question. All right, so only the grubs actually overwinter, and I guess that's the last point in the slide. So then notice how these guys are completely white. When they're white, they have a very active digestive tract. Another reason that they're white is, is because they're actually eating food waste that gets fairly high in temperature, up to about 130, 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Earthworms can't survive at those temperatures. Now, that doesn't mean that your bin gets to 145. It's just the layer below them. And so they're constantly exchanging heat between the surface of the bin and themselves. So now, another part, when they're white, they have that full digestive tract. So once you see them change color, you know that they're about to excrete that digestive tract. They also, at this point, are going to try to camouflage and hide somewhere where they can pupate. So the fact is, is why is it 
that nature chooses this organism to change its color. I think that's very convenient from a, an industrial processing perspective is you know who's good and who's not. So this is what I would feed the chickens. Um, so the nice thing about the pre-pupil, because he, he let go of his entire digestive system, his, he, he has this razor blade as a mouth part. And that's what he uses to eat at the cell walls. Well now, he doesn't have that, he still has it, but he uses it as a little thing to climb. Well, because his climbing tool is bigger than the house fly, we designed these units to have ramps of over 30 degrees. And that makes it very hard for the house fly to get out of these units. It makes it very easy for them to get out. So that's another safety control in a way to prevent f disease vector flies from taking over this bin and reaching out and mixing in with your feed and doing all that kind of stuff. So again, they're, they're the big boys, they're a little stronger, uh, they've got a natural climbing tool uh, once they reach the pre-pupil stage. And at the pre-pupil stage, obviously, they've got their maximum nutritional reserves, they've abandoned all their digestive organs, and they also start cleaning themselves because they're about to pupate. So they secrete antibiotics. They can live in this stage for about seven days looking for a suitable spot to pupate. Okay, and they have this natural tendency to want to exit. So when I look at that, so imagine I've got a colony in here, and the white ones are getting fatter, they're getting fatter, and then at one point they turn brown. Now they're saying, I can't eat anymore. I need to get out of here. I want to clean myself. So they finally find a ramp, and they go in the corner of the crease of the ramp, and they go up, and they go straight into what I kind of call, you know, it's just a collection slit. So it directs them into now the collection bucket. Um, you don't need that bucket. You saw that in the other video where people just put these straight into their uh, chicken pen. Um, actually, for Hawaii, that's what I would recommend because your pen is a lot safer for mongoose and everything else. So the, just put the food waste in here. The chickens aren't going to knock it over. You take this lid away, and all you have is a natural ramp and then an automatic feeder for your chickens. It's better to be fed automatically because that you'll notice that some ladies are more dominant than others. So what, what happens is, is it allows for all the chickens to get at least a time a day where they can eat their grubs. And as you now see going on outside, it's just a few grubs a minute, you know. It's, it's, it's not much. It's just a trickle. But that just keeps coming and coming and coming. So anyway, in that perspective, this pre-pupil stage, he's got seven days to find a place where he wants to pupate. And so let's look at the pupa. So the, the pupa is really the process of where you go from a cocoon to a fly and obviously it had to dig and hide and it's very vulnerable to predators so it really it really wants to hide and so and this will then become an adult in about seven days so at this point he never eats again so this is probably the easiest stage because it's very similar to a butter you know butterfly um, yes sir I was just wondering what the grubs, allow to become an adult and have more of the adults laying eggs? Well, obviously, if, uh, if you, you're... What was the question? The question was, is there any advantage of actually allowing them to pupate uh, and becoming flying adults? And so, obviously, the understanding is, is correct, sir, that we harvest right here. So, for most of them, the life cycle ends right here and that's what we use to make chicken feed. Um, but for one of the most startling advance, uh, advantages that I've seen is there was a lady in Texas, in Arlington. She had a third of an acre property in middle of suburban, um, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth. And she had kept a diary since 1986 about her adventures with raising insects. And she was ashamed to 
tell anybody that she was growing maggots, okay? And so what she then found our website and started talking to me and comes over and presents me a catalog of everything that she had done. Now, she didn't have a biopod. She was using more compost barrels, and she, was, she couldn't harvest them, so she was letting them pupate, okay? And I said, well, what do you notice when you've been pupating larvae for the last 30 years, you know? And she says, oh, the benefits are amazing. I said, what do you mean? Well, she says, I'm a bird lover. And so she says, I've been seeing flycatchers return, sparrows, swallows, everything. So she is in the middle of an urban area, and she's got an oasis for insect-eating birds. And there's a lot of birds that right now have had that loss because there's nothing to eat because of our, our urbanization and our intensive agricultural use. So in that sense, even if you don't grow chickens or you're not going to feed pigs or you're not going to do anything, um, you know, you don't have to per se harvest and go into a bucket or buy a biopod, but they will pupate out of your compost pile and contribute to your backyard ecology. And I think that a 30-year track record uh, was pretty convincing in my argument that there is definitely benefits. Now the nice thing about it is they die in seven days. <laughs> and here's the adults. So the adult actually lives in the canopy. If the female does not date and mate on day one, she will not live long enough to lay her eggs. She's living off her reserves. So typically around, oh, sorry. Typically around day one, she mates, and then seven days later, she will lay her eggs. And then she dies within a few hours. And so when people, uh, entomologists, observe this, uh, they're actually classified as beneficial insect species. Um, and same with ladybugs. So I like to say that they're as beneficial as ladybugs. So here's the life cycle. In order to get a successful biopod, what do you need? You need a tree that has black soldier fly in it. You need a biopod, and you need to start putting in food waste, okay? And you slowly put in food waste because your colony is not instantaneously that you've got 10 to 20 or 30,000 visitors in there. It takes about one female to lay about five to 600 viable eggs at, um, per female. So it takes a few females to come in there, so you've got to build up a little bit of stink. But, and in the meantime, you're going to get other pest flies. Sorry, go ahead. How much waste just, a, just a handful to start out. Obviously, when you're starting out a protopod, which like those large ones, you really have to understand what you're doing, and you've got to work with a little bit more stink. Um, but it works. I mean, just a handful. Um, what you don't want to do is go over four inches of waste until you've got an inch of grubs in there. And most people think that's a crazy number, but that really helps out a lot of people. So, so the mating, actually this is a picture of them mating, by the way. Uh, they're joined there. And so that happens in, in the trees. Yes? Um, can you use just vegetable matter? You can. Um, it, I'm going to go into the, what you can use. Um, there's a few techniques, and I've learned that in Hawaii things work a little differently, so I've nuanced it to the Hawaiian uh, methods. So um, anyway, so the mating happens, and after the female, the, after day seven, she's ready to go lay eggs, and then she comes and flies into the biopod underneath the lid, and then what she does is she quickly lays her eggs and dies. The egg laying, as you see right here, that's actually egg laying. That tail is going down and depositing eggs right there. And so eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get grubs on the bottom. And then when those grubs, you know, are mature and miraculously they go up the ramp and they go into the collection device. So that's kind of how these units work uh, looking at it from the side. So what's important here as you're talking about, ultimately a unit like this at home with enough grubs could handle about five pounds of waste a day. That does not mean that you're going to start by putting in five pounds a day. 
okay? You're going to end up with an anaerobic soup or mess very quickly, okay? And that's why I kind of say there's a simple rule. It, in, if the waste that you've put in there the day before is fully digested and reduced, you, you need, sorry, all of the waste put in one day must be fully digested and reduced before adding waste the following day. After about a week of feeding a healthy colony of grubs, the operator starts to learn what quantity of a particular waste his grubs can handle. Does that make sense? So you, it, it, starting a grub colony is a daily practice, just like feeding your chickens is a daily practice. And so you just kind of say, whoa, they didn't eat anything, or I smell something bad, or maybe I need to give it a rest. That's that's how you in tune with the organism. Um, you can read my manual, most people don't. Um, so the point is I'm trying to make is see how much they're eating. What, what, what we've got down there on the papaya, most of that is gone within a day. That allows me tomorrow to feed another 50 pounds, you see? So from that aspect, you also use your nose and you just think, if it stinks like that, Something's wrong. If it's glow septic, something's wrong. Sir? Is there anything reasonably common, like, say, citrus fries that they don't like, you know of? They won't eat french fries. Well, that's too dry. Yeah. It, it, too, too, well, here's a good point. is uh, A unit, a, a prototype unit that was just a little bit bigger than this. Not much. Uh, my dad was at home, and... He lived in Louisiana today, and this Cajun came by and said, Mr. Paul, can I throw in some alligator waste? My dad said, sure, go ahead. So around 5 o'clock, my dad stops working, goes over, takes a look in there, and the whole unit is filled to the brim. And he put in about 80 pounds of alligator waste. Well, my dad was about to get a heart attack. Anyway... His unit was about the size that was about three to four square foot of surface area. This is about two. And so that allows him to digest about 10 pounds a day. His colony was very active, very healthy. And so after day five, it got a little stinky and he just stopped, feed, didn't feed it. Day six, day seven. And after a week, the only thing left was that hard outside alligator skin. So when you think about the stuff they don't eat, it's nails, hair, epithelials that are really, really tough. Uh, I'm sure if you put rhinoceros horn in there, it would stay the same, bone, all that kind of stuff. But anything that is full of nutrients, that isn't, that's what they're gonna go for. Um, other stuff that doesn't go well is high cellulose, like wood, no nutrients. Uh, a lot of grass clippings, not that good. Uh, now, when we're doing the slaughterhouse waste, the grass in the stomach that's been pre-digested by the cow, they love that stuff. So it's just a matter of how available the nutrients are and how hard something is. But that's probably one of the only things that they can get to. Yes, ma'am? you have to pick out the bones or things that um, Sometimes. It all depends how big and how strong. The, the overall environment in there is acidic, and it takes a little longer for most things to break down. But you start putting in, you know, pounds of T-bones, you're going to end up with pounds of T-bones. You know, it's, that doesn't make a difference. Um, but, again, that's the hardness factor, so it coincides with what I uh, just down the earlier. Yes, sir? When you showed a picture a while ago, uh, two fish, one was fresh, or at least not cooked, and the other was cooked. Why was, why, you know why it eats the one that's cooked? Okay, let me repeat the question. On the video, why was the cooked fish eaten faster than the not cooked fish? Anybody have a hypothesis? Softer. Softer. That, that's all. <laughs> Eventually they'll get to it. Um, so, yes? Tomorrow you're going to add 50 pounds. Would that level decrease that you have in the house oh, right oh, now? Oh yeah, um, if you look at those units, you'll see dirt marks, and um, 
within a few days, last week we started observing losses of two or three inches of volume. Um, yeah, 80% of the volume is eaten within the first 24 hours. So uh, you by tomorrow you'll see that the waistline was higher before you fed it. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, uh, the, as I understood the question, is there certain ways that you can incorporate the IMOs, am I correct? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, the funny part is, is that we've actually noticed uh, IMO-like cultures popping up in our older biopods. Biopods that were about a year to two years in service started getting all this kind of white mycelium on the bottom. And when Texas A&M started doing bacteriological analysis of the culture, it's found out to be a bacillus simplicitus, which is just, IMO is about 80% bacillus. So um, there's definitely a lot of synergy between natural farming and insect farming in that regard. So. Let me tell you this way, that I could not get a colony that large going without IMO and lab. The reason is I would go anaerobic, and for people who don't understand what that means, you've got to go to more natural farming <laughs> lectures, okay? So I'm not going to get into that, but there is a clear symbiosis, and I'm a big advocate of Master Joe, so. What goes on with the liquid? I'll get into that. Okay. So seeding a biopod is really a matter of smell. Remember that female's got to come out of the tree and she has to go lay an egg. So if you've got something more stinky around the corner, she might go to that. Uh, so be aware of what generates odors in your surrounding and work with that. Sometimes if somehow you know, grubs are laying eggs somewhere else, all you need to do is transfer them, and then they can smell that their own species is already somewhere there, and they recognize it, and then more and more come. So seeding sometimes is, is, is a little bit of confusing process, a lot, you know, on the mainland I sell starter colonies, I can't do that to Hawaii, they won't allow me to import insects. Um, so, but they, you don't need to, you guys have some of the most amazing climate in the world, so, from that aspect, I think that odor is an important aspect. So at first, you do attract other insects. You will get house fly, you will get fruit fly. There is no way around this because those insects are like the first responders, but they don't stay, they don't last. And so the whole trick about insect farming is to get a colony that is healthy and so successful to get it up and then stay there. And that's the power of bioconversion. So I say that it takes about seven to 10 days before you will actually see active hatchlings. When the egg, it only takes about three, hour, three days for the eggs to hatch, but to actually see them, expect seven to 10 days. And like I said, disease vectors disappear over time. So what can we use? Obviously, seeding materials, and you'll see this in my manual, Fruits and vegetables, pasta and breads, coffee grinds. They like the smell of coffee grinds, I can't help it. But what I've noticed on the guys that are on the dry side of the islands, those coffee grinds tend to dry out and cake up. So coffee grinds might not be that good, but on the wetter, more humid sides, and in Texas, they love coffee grinds. You could also use coconut flesh, melons, papayas, and anything that's a little bit fermented is a really good attractant. The reason that we, I like fermented goods is because it's an odor that many a times we can still tolerate, so that's why you can use it. If you want to get a little bit more adventurous or you're having issues getting started, you can think about adding tender meats, not steak and red meat, but like uh, what the experience has been is in chicken skins and a little bit of guts, a little bit of there and there. Also, you put in one or two fish, mm, they're gonna come real soon. Now, obviously the fish is a little bit more of a nuisance, 
because of its smell than fermented corn, for example. So that's why I put these guys separately. It's only if you're having issues that you kind of resort to these and you want to get them going. And then a very important point is, is that you want to control liquids. And we've been discussing, because of the fact that Hawaii has so many different type of ecosystems, from wet to dry, people get very confused reading my manuals that were written in Texas about what, what's the appropriate, what, what are the things to look for. So what I kind of say is, did you see what was out there? Didn't that kind of look like a moist glob of food waste? Well, so I kind of came up with a theory in the last two weeks. I call it the cow patty theory. In other words, if it, you're trying to get a cow patty from edge to edge in whatever your device is. And in order to be that, it's not a week old cow patty that's all dry and crusty. No, you want it to be nice and moist. But at the same time, you don't want to you know, fill with liquids and you know, the, 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 there's no water standing there, but it is moist to the touch. And so, in that sense, moisture is a very important part in getting a biopod seeded. And so, moisture is also what's going to give you smell. And guess what? If you add too much moisture and you flood a unit, you'll get way too much smell. And then you've got to calm down. So, it's a give and take type of process. So, patience when seeding to avoid flooding. Um, I never add liquids directly. I've had experiences uh, in Oahu on the dry side that they actually pour liquids on. And this is the wonderful part about the Biopod Plus is it comes with a drainage plate and a drainage pad. And this is what a lot of the do-it-yourself bins don't have. And this thing can drain. And that's really important. And then there's a, a drainage hole on the bottom there. And there's actually there's a kit that gives you an attachment so that you can actually use it to harvest the teas and direct them into a can or a collection device. So liquids are great to get seeded, but eventually you're going to slow down on the liquids. The reason is because there's so much liquid in your food waste. And as they eat more, they will, they will regulate all the liquids for you. So initially, you you know, kind of like worm bins, when you get a little bit too wet, you can do that too. So that brings me to the next, is what is the right moisture? Free liquids should never accumulate in the biopod. What I mean with free liquids, I mean like there's a pool of something in there. Why? Because on the bottom of that pool is anaerobic bacteria. For the natural farmers in here, when I see that, I try to dissipate it and I split spray lab because I fight the anaerobic bacteria to the T and so does the grub. Also the right moisture, think cow patty. I've already explained that to you guys, but that's kind of, that's exactly what insects go for is that fresh, highly reactive, full of beneficial bacteria uh, type of patty. So flooding can also be caused by too much food. And I think that's important is uh, too much papaya, too much cantaloupe, too much shredding, and a device that doesn't have appropriate drainage. Uh, we don't, I, I used to get on the first biopod that was circular, didn't have drainage, but had a kind of a filter that went into a jar. That filter would clog up all the time depending on what type of waste my customers were using. Well, in that scenario, um, what would happen is People would call and say, the whole thing souped up, I added too much food, da da da. So, I, people don't understand that there's a lot of moisture that comes in with the food. And so, your nose tells you, at first cost, if anything is going anaerobic. And so, you see what they eat and you smell, and that's how it works. Doesn't mean that you have to, you know, get real close. It just, you just use your instinct there. So. What are the symptoms of a failing pod? Strong, foul odors detectable from a few feet away. Notice that for the amount of food waste that was in there, it wasn't a strong, foul odor. The presence of any undigested, smelly paste. I call this, sorry for my lack of science, I call it baby poo. It's brown, it's mucky, you don't know what it is, and it starts accumulating a few inches down. That is anaerobicity. 
and it smells like baby poo when you poke through it, and so you just don't, it does not smell like spaghetti sauce or papaya, trust me. And so at that point, that's when you know that natural farmers, you apply lab. Um, and um, another, in, another aspect of a flooding pod is you suddenly see massive crawl-offs. E even the grubs don't like it anymore. Um, you know, typically you would smell something before that happens, but just for people that need to know that, massive exodus means something's wrong. So also temperature is very important. Um, think about this thing. Uh, you do not put this in, in this direct sunlight. Uh, it's kind of like a car in a parking lot. Um, it just will heat up and the organism generates so much heat from the inside that it needs to vent and needs to be well shaded. So whatever you do with these units, they have to have shade. There's just no buts about it. Once the units get over 100 degrees, they can't ventilate properly. Granted, the grubs can tolerate higher temperatures, but they can't tolerate higher environments. In other words, if the compost underneath them is at 135, they definitely need something of 90 to 80 in the air above them. If that air temperature goes above 100, they start getting into trouble between the, the, the heat underneath them. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, most Spanish countries. They want to just go for a siesta and not do anything. Well, that's exactly what you don't want. So ventilation is key to keeping reactivity up. And in dry climates, I, I recommend misting but not spraying. Uh, Mindy tells me in startup you can definitely spray on directly. I believe her. I don't have to deal with the dry conditions in Oahu, but she does. So, and a symptom of an overheated biopod is unwanted crawl out. It's too hot in there, or um, what you'll notice is they're like peeking on whatever the highest point of waste, and they're just like sitting on there trying to fan or trying to cool off. So. That's just kind of, you know, your instinctual behavior, it's, it's too hot. And then I want to bring out a very important aspect as uh, pathogens. The biopod is a bioconverter. It's not a sanitizer. So you put roadkill in, you have risky stuff out. And so since I'm talking to farmers the quality of your inputs is crucial here. You don't go store inputs for a long period of time and then expect that when the grubs are hungry you're going to release them. Many times those inputs can have gone bad, stale, mold, botulism, all kinds of pathogens. So the trick is, is that many times when your inputs have gone bad, guess what they do? They stink. When I take offal from the slaughterhouse, offal's pretty disgusting, but it's fresh. It doesn't stink. And they work with that like a charm. If I start taking in stuff that really, really stink, it, trust me, offal has a distinctive odor, but it's not what you would get into. You wait three days and it's a completely different odor, okay? And so that's very important is that the moment that you've gone septic or anaerobic or kind of under roadkill conditions or anything like that, you, you know, it, it just smells. And your nose tells you that it's bad. So if it stinks, it's already bad. So are you then going to want to harvest those grubs and feed them to your chickens? Not no. When you do that, you're taking a risk. And so I, I do want to emphasize, and very important, is that when handling food waste, it has to be fresh. So cleaning out a latrine off of a pig stall that has been accumulating for over a year, A, does not have a lot of nutrients for these guys. It's pretty much, it's, it, it's gone anaerobic, it's lost most of its nutrient value. And B, that's a risk factor. But if you're able to take manure on a daily basis and put them in, fine. So, and then another Hawaiiism is, what do you do? in dry climates. I get this feedback from Hawaii a lot. And we have four suggestions that are a little bit more than the biopod. The first one I call is the lunchbox method. Because this unit drains so well, I might want to start out by putting in just a lunchbox with like wet stuff. 
And so it's going to get stinky and smelly. And then once I notice that the black soldier fly have set in in that lunch box, then I can start removing it and adding more waste. So that's the thing. Then Mike made me do this, is the puka watermelon method. Okay? What you do is you poke a lot of holes on a watermelon, on a papaya on one side, and you take the watermelon and put it on top of your compost pile. And guess what's going to happen about 10 days later? It's full of black soldier fly inside the watermelon. And guess what you do? You just take the watermelon, dump it in your biopod, and you got yourself a colony. <laughs> uh, the other aspect is one of my favorites. It's the juice or pulp. In other words, when some, if you've got a jamba juice or any type of fruit juice stand, that juice is full of nutrients. And what I take is I'll take that pulp and I hydrate it a little bit. I add a little bit of water to it to get the right moisture for a dry climate. And you'll notice that pulp actually expands. You don't want to make it into a slop. You just want it to become wet to the touch. And you add a layer of that pulp every day. Wonderful way to get started. Okay. And then another way is uh, a lot of the worm guys have issues with this is that when you create a lot of worm tea or you've got leachate from other biopods, you can actually take a little bit of paper and start adding scented runoff from existing biopods or existing worm, tea, worm, worm factory or, or other commercial, and that will make something very attractive to come in there. Now, you still put in food waste, don't get me wrong. And the reason I say add paper is I don't want liquids to pool in there. I just want the scent of those liquids to infect the paper. So, so those are really my ideas behind why I created the Biopod. It's, in a way, I didn't invent anything. And I want people to know that. All I've done is I've created a way to harvest the organism in relationship to its natural life cycle. In a way, this is just a composter that takes into account that he wants to get out. It is nothing more than that. It is pure biomimicry. It is learning from nature what nature does best. So in that sense, it's nothing special. Yes, ma'am? Okay, um, to, what happens is, is that every insect has, I would say, a whole onslaught of beneficial microbes that live in synchrony with it. The microbes that the black soldier fly does not like are anaerobic. It does not like anaerobes. It will do everything to fight against anaerobes. It actually tunnels through the waste and adds aeration pockets. Sometimes your anaerobic conditions are too strong that the insect itself is not powerful enough to combat the anaerobicity, so you want to help it. And so in natural farming, is there's many times need for creating soils that are also have very good aeration. So Master Cho had discovered that you could use lactic acid bacteria, hence the abbreviation of lab, to actually come in into anaerobic spots and start aerating that thing too. So when the insect can't aerate, it's sometimes beneficial to have a microorganism that can add aerobic activity to an anaerobic environment. It's a lot better to spray lab than it is Think of it as tooth decay. If you've got, you know, a decaying tooth, the last thing that you want to do is take that decay and spread it all over. What really what you want to do is be able to fix the solution on the one tooth and keep everything else out of it. That's the same principle with the lab. You don't want to spread it all over and think that it's going to disappear. No. It's still the same amount of bacteria that the, the organism has to take care of. So when the organism fails, the lactic acid bacteria, by the way, lactic acid bacteria is what you find in yogurt. So, but Master Cho has more things to that. So, I hope you understand why I designed the biopod. We make them in the United States. This is not made in China. It takes us about an hour to make one. They're rotomolded. Um, 
and we've produced them in Texas. Mindy has them on sale. I think she has only 10 units today. Five left. Five left. And um, so my shipping charges, if you need to FedEx them from Dallas, is about $80. So obviously that doesn't have to take place today. So I really think there's an opportunity there. But ultimately why I created this unit was to create a beehive for an insect. If you think about it in history, man has only cultivated two insects. It's the honeybee and the silkworm. And I really hope that our sense of our need for ecological solutions can encourage us to cultivate a third one. So that why is I assume that the biopod is the beehive for the black soldier fly. Yes. Robert, does the escaping insect or does it want to go up or down or anywhere to escape? Does it have a propensity to go up? The reason we make them go up is because housefly can't go up on the same angle as they can. So that's a way to kind of keep the bin. Um, but they can go sideways too. The problem with sideways if, is that they're, it's harder to channel the crawl off because if your waist level changes at any point in time, then it becomes, you've got to readjust your ramps or whatever if you've got like, some, there's a lot of do-it-yourself units out there and they're great. And they're really good at just getting the same type of waste reduction. And, but where it makes a difference on having a plastic unit is there's no nooks and crannies where liquids can escape, where the grubs can get, you know, where you lose them. So I still have to find a very inexpensive biopod in the sense that do-it-yourself or that can actually um, have the same crawl-off efficiency as a custom plastic shape. Also, let me tell you that we've worked with all kinds of prototypes. We've been doing this since 1998, just to let you know. We've had prototypes made out of metal, gone in six months. Galvanized steel eaten through. Part of the galvanization actually induced toxicity in the fertility cycles of it. So there's a whole bunch of things. I know a lot of environmental guys don't want to see another plastic unit, but it is the only thing that really allows us to guide that migratory behavior. And that's really what I'm doing. Is This is a composter with a guided or assisted migratory system. That's it. So anyway, uh, yes? Typically, using food waste, if I use manure, this thing will fill up before you can even imagine. But using food waste, only 5% of your food waste will stay behind. And so a typical family of five will not fill this up within a year. Because the grubs eat 95%. So these units are rated to about, one, once your colony is established, five pounds a day. That's a lot for most families. And then that would produce about one pound of grub. And that, I think, sustains a good eight, pushing it to 12 chickens. But, you know, you can also let them go and support the songbird. So, does that answer that? Yes, ma'am? How do you clean it out when it's time? There's two ways of doing that. You stop feeding it. If you stop feeding it, eventually the last grub is going to crawl out and you've got finished compost left. Very easy process. Um, another way is, is that um, you, know, you can just dump it and bury it or do something of that nature and let them fend for themselves. Um, typically, if you were to go on an extended holiday, that's what you would do. You, know, you don't know. Especially, I've learned a lot about Hawaiian mongoose. Uh, <laughs> so I... You know, just in respect for your neighbors in your neighborhood, is you, you just don't want them to go take off with everything that's in there. So you just let them die down, and it's very, very natural. Uh, colder climates, people will let them die down, and then in the wintertime, actually start putting an earthworm and take them indoors. So, yes? So, like, when you say colder climate, like, our climate is pretty much good you, all you, year around? Yeah, you're not cold. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, may, maybe on the top of a mountain, but, but uh, yeah, go ahead. What do you call cold? 
when your maximum daytime temperature drops below 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the hottest time of the day. Is that if that's below 75, that's cold. Okay. So some of us live up in a volcano. You once you're above 4,000 feet, you'll start seeing a lot less of the natural black soldier fly. Um, You should be fine. But it gets like 60 during the day. Here, yeah, but here's the thing. If you, during your climate cycles, observe bees. If you've got bees active during certain parts of the year, assume they're all active too. So they're all flying insects, so they all work and operate at the same time of year. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not a weather expert. I can't tell you exactly about your location. And by the way, Volcanoes National Park rocks. Um, but that, you know, sometimes you just have to be in tune with your ecosystem, and bees are a good indicator of them. So, yes, ma'am? Do you have any trouble with the yellow jackets that we have here? No. To come in and no. No. Well, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a final note. I've got one last treat for you guys. It's a special menu offer at McDonald's. It's called the Mug Grub. And here we go. Where's the timer? Where's the timer? There's no timer, sorry. This is about six hours. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you guys.